Today, we're gonna to build your knowledge and problem solving skills by going in depth on bootloaders and EEPROMs. I've decided to make a playlist suitable for beginners to 3D printing, and I've already got a few entries in place. This video is going to be added to that, and the topics included will be bootloaders and EEPROMs, both simple topics in isolation, but for a beginner, they can be quite daunting to get your head around. I once saw in a community group that someone was going to buy a bootloader from Amazon. Hopefully this video makes it clear that that is an absolute scam. Another problem I always see for people is that they've compiled custom firmware, but the changes don't actually translate over to the real 3D printer. We're gonna cover how that's possible by learning about the EEPROM, as well as what it means when you get an EEPROM CRC error. 3D printers have a lot of components and can be pretty daunting for beginners. However, a lot of the components are quite simple in isolation and can help us understand the bigger picture. In this video, we're aiming to learn about a bootloader and an EEPROM. Let's start with the bootloader, and all its job is, is to enable easy firmware updating without the need of a special programmer. If we're preparing 3D printing firmware, we make our changes, compile the firmware, and hopefully with some success, we'll then have a firmware binary file for 32-bit boards or a hex file for 8-bit boards but we still need to get that file onto the 3D printer mainboard in order to run our 3D printer firmware. Here are a range of programmers fit for this task, and they're all quite similar. This is a clone programmer that comes with the Creality BL touch kits. It's got a USB port on one side and then a 3x2 six pin header on the other. This programmer from SparkFun is my favorite. It can do two jobs. You can plug in an ATtiny microcontroller plus the usual pins outputting, to which I've made up a custom loom to plug into a 3D printer mainboard. And here is the programming header on a Creality 3D mainboard. It's labeled ISP for in-system programming. And here's an SKR version 1.3 32-bit board with the same header, this time labeled in-circuit system programmer. For this process, we match up the pins, plug in the programmer to the mainboard, and then the programmer to the PC but many people are able to update their 3D printer firmware without one of these programmers. So why is that possible? Enter our bootloader, and as we said earlier, its job is to enable firmware updating without the need of a programmer. Whether you've got an 8-bit microcontroller or a 32-bit ARM processor, a common element is the programming or flash space. This is the storage where the firmware resides. When the machine is powered on, the 3D printer firmware is loaded and the machine operates as we would expect. When we use a bootloader, we give up a little bit of that flash space with the 3D printer firmware occupying what it needs from the remaining capacity. So what actually happens when we update the firmware? The board is powered up and the important thing to realize here is that the bootloader runs first. It checks for new firmware on the SD card, typically firmware.bin, and if the bootloader finds this, it firstly deletes the old firmware from the flash space before writing the new updated firmware in its place. After this, typically a new firmware.cur file is created and then the 3D printer firmware will run. An 8-bit mainboard is slightly different because we plug in a USB cable between the printer and our computer. The bootloader still runs first, except this time tries to establish a serial connection to the computer and if the computer has the same intent, they handshake and then the program space is updated, then the 3D printer runs as usual. I'm sure you'll agree that bootloaders make updating very convenient, so what's the argument against them? Firstly, our microcontroller or processor has a finite amount of flash space. So if the bootloader is taking up some of that space, that means less left over for our actual firmware. Some 8-bit boards have quite a small amount of flash space, so rather than start disabling firmware features, if you have a programmer, it might be better to just ditch the bootloader. The second reason is a matter of timing. All of these steps by the bootloader take time. And even if there's no update, it still takes time to check for the correct file. If we ditch the bootloader, we power up the printer and the firmware runs instantly. I think most people would agree that slightly faster booting of a 3D printer would be nice, 
but not really essential and they'd rather have the bootloader, especially if it means they don't have to open up the electronics case to have the access required to plug in their programmer. If your 3D printer is missing a bootloader and there's plenty of popular printers that don't come with them, I've already got a couple of guides that you can follow. While it is easier to use one of these specialist programmers, they're not mandatory and instead you can use a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino Uno combined with some jumper cables to get the job done. In summary, a bootloader is just a piece of software residing on the processor or microcontroller that makes updating our 3D printer firmware quite convenient. So let's turn our attention to our second topic, the EEPROM. Essentially, this is a memory device that enables the storage of printer parameters even after the printer is turned off. An EEPROM is essentially a memory device, one that holds its contents even when the power is turned off. EEPROM stands for Electrically Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory. Now read-only memory or ROM means the same thing it does in a CD or DVD ROM, but really the important part is that first E for electrically. On an EEPROM with only one E, we can erase our memory, but not electrically. The EEPROM chips had a little window on the top and required UV light from a special eraser, or if you wanted to try your luck, leaving it in the sun. And that's not gonna cut it for on the fly 3D printer settings changes. Thankfully, because our 3D printers have an EEPROM, we can save our settings as we go. EEPROMs have traditionally been physical chips that sit on the surface of the main board. However, some 32-bit boards don't have this, so instead they have to emulate the EEPROM, giving up part of the available program space to dedicate some bytes to storing values. Other times, a file is created on the SD card where these values are stored instead. Whatever the form the EEPROM takes, its function is the same. EEPROMs are an example of non-volatile memory, and that means that the settings are still stored after power is lost or the printer is rebooted. This is opposed to memory such as RAM that will be lost after a power loss or the printer is rebooted. To understand what an EEPROM does for our 3D printer, let's have a look at how Marlin is constructed. The many parameters that make up the configuration for our 3D printers are set as we alter the firmware source before we compile Marlin for our specific 3D printer's needs. We also know that other settings can be changed on the fly after compilation via either the LCD or via a terminal. So all parameters can be changed when the firmware is compiled, but only some of them can be changed when the printer is running. For instance, we can change our acceleration settings on the fly, but if we want to change the actual printer volume, we're going to need to recompile firmware. It's important to make the distinction here that the EEPROM only deals with those settings that we can change on the fly after the firmware has been compiled. We're going to follow an example through to explore how the EEPROM works. For this example, the value is going to be our steps per unit for the extruder. For an Ender 3, the default is 93. This hard-coded value is non-volatile, but we can't write to it when the printer is running. Fortunately, the printer has its own RAM, which we can alter as much as we want while the printer is running, but it will be lost on power down. The very first time we turn on our 3D printer, the hard-coded E-steps value from the firmware is loaded into the RAM, and as soon as we print, this is the value that will be used. Hypothetically, let's say we calibrate our extruder and find that the actual E-steps need to be 95.8. We can change this via the LCD or by sending a G-code command. In either case, we've updated the value stored in the RAM to 95.8, and that's the value that will be used if we print again. Once we shut down and then reboot the printer, however, we'll find that the value has reverted back to 93. And that's because our RAM value is the most important one, but it's also lost on power off. What we should have done is go to store settings or send an M500 via G code. This brings our non volatile EEPROM into play with the value of 95.8 from the RAM being saved in the EEPROM. It's critical to understand that when the printer is turned on, it tries to take its values from the EEPROM before it does the hard coded values from the firmware. So next time we boot the printer, our modified E-steps of 95.8 will be loaded into the RAM and used as we print. So what happens if we fit a geared extruder and the new correct E-steps is something like 265? 
We make our changes in the firmware, recompile and upload to the printer's main board. Even though our hard-coded eSteps is 265, remember the preference is to read from the EEPROM, so when the printer boots, the eSteps will still be 95.8. This is something I see catch out people all of the time. Maybe they've upgraded to TMC steppers and their stepper motors are running really hot because the current is being set by a strange value in the EEPROM rather than what they've hard-coded into their firmware. One of the best diagnostic tools you have if you have a misfunction in 3D printer is to enter M503 via console. This will produce all of the current values from the printer's RAM and if you've just booted up that means those that have just been loaded from the EEPROM. It's often a good step before any modification to enter M503 and copy and paste the result somewhere in case you need to get back to any of your old values. So how do we resolve our scenario where our e-steps in the firmware are being ignored because of the old value stored in the EEPROM? One option is to use the console to send the direct command, in this case M92E265. That will set the current value stored in the RAM as 265 and we can verify this by entering an M503 in the console. We still have to remember to enter an M500, so this value in the RAM is saved to the EEPROM for the next boot. Another option is to go to Restore Defaults on the LCD. This has the effect of ignoring the EEPROM and loading all of the hard-coded firmware values into the RAM. We can see that the value stored in the EEPROM is still incorrect, so we still have to remember to store the settings and again that will save everything to EEPROM for the next time we boot. There's one other option that I've never had to use and that's load settings or M501. And what that does is load anything from the EEPROM to overwrite what is temporarily in the RAM. One final EEPROM related error that can really spook people is the CRC error. Generally this is easily explainable and nothing to be concerned about. Here's an example of how this can happen. Let's say we're using ABL and probing a 3x3 grid. Storing that mesh plus the other settings takes up a certain amount of space in the EEPROM. So let's say we now recompile our firmware with a 5x5 grid, which means we have another 16 values to store in the EEPROM. When we boot up the printer, there's going to be a mismatch in sizes and the error is triggered. Sometimes the error might happen because of an update to the structure of Marlin and not because of your own changes. When this happens, the printer will load all of the hard-coded settings into the RAM and this will rectify the problem. If we then store these settings to the EEPROM, we shouldn't have this error again. But just remember, sometimes you have values stored in the EEPROM that you don't have hard-coded in the firmware. This could be something like the Z offset for a BL touch or the offsets between two nozzles in a switching hot end which you may have painstakingly determined with a lot of trial and error. That's why I again recommend entering M503 and saving the results somewhere before any major modifications. In summary, here are the take home points. A bootloader is just a free piece of software that makes updating firmware very easy for our 3D printers. The majority of new printers, especially 32-bit ones, are gonna have that already in place. But some printers like the Ender 3 are still going to have that issue to be overcome by the user. An EEPROM is just a convenient way of storing 3D printer settings even when the power is turned off. Use M503 to record all of your saved settings before undertaking modifications. If your printer is acting really strange, use M502 to initialize the EEPROM and load the hard-coded firmware settings. That's going to wrap this one up. If you've still got any questions, please leave them down below in the comments. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe, and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.